Um, actually, before I forget, I need you to sign a piece, you know, one of those forms that says I've been at a really important symposium. It's got lots of CPD qualities there. I, I don't need it, by the way, for my university. I need it for my wife, who thinks I'm having way too much fun. <laughs> yeah, there's that as well. So thank you very much. And when, when Larry asked me to come and give this talk, I said, I've only got three talks. Which one would you like me to give? I've got a talk on Alzheimer's disease, molecular biology and mechanisms. I've got a talk on biomarkers. And I've got a talk on setting up a translational psychiatry center. Larry said, that'll do. Um, give all three. Um, but give it in the same sort of time as you'd normally give one. So I'm just going to show you about 60 slides really, really quickly. <laughs> um, so where should we start? This is a good place to start. Does it, somebody recognizes this date. So this is May the 8th, 1945. VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Uh, Churchill announces uh, that Hitler... Uh, has died or whatever he did and uh, surrendered peace and you know there was a lot of celebrating as you can imagine huge celebrations all all over oh what have i done huge celebrations all over all over london all over europe let me just see if i can play this sound properly there you go have we got sound on? Yeah. <laughs> but to unbounded rejoicing. If anybody still believed that we didn't know how to enjoy ourselves, these victory days disprove them once and for all. For the country gave them In and about Whitehall, fully 50,000 people, like millions all over the country, gave themselves over to unbounded rejoicing. If anybody still believed that we didn't know how to enjoy ourselves, these victory days disproved them once and for all. When night fell, there were still the great crowds, bigger than ever. All London made a night of it. Piccadilly Circus was the centre of it all. See, that's how an Englishman really should speak. <laughs> Huge celebrations, though. The men were coming back from the front. There were lovers reunited. There were lots of handsome Americans in uniform uh, wandering around the UK. What do you think happened next? <laughs> so in February 1946, a baby was born, and then another baby, and then another baby, and then another... And for 15 glorious years, we had a massive expansion of the population in Europe. Right up to, in fact, and I don't mean to be narcissistic about this, going back to your opening talk, but right up until my birthday. Actually, at the very point that the baby boomer generation ended. And that's why I started off like this, because this is a real and substantial change in our populations. And just last year in the UK, for various reasons a few more a few years earlier in the US the first of the baby boomer generation started to take a pension and this is a really substantial problem i mean it's a wonderful thing you know it's just tremendous that there were all these people born it's just tremendous that we're living longer but it is a really substantial issue for all of us you'll recognize these these are age pyramids this is the uh, population frequency at different ages and this is how it used to look until very recently. This is how it's now looking. And there is a substantial increase in the numbers of elderly. So for all of you that are younger than me, and it's very many of you in the audience, the situation is much, much worse than Larry told us about in that opening slide. Remember the graph? And you have 80 years, 40 productive years, 40 unproductive years. It's way worse than that, Larry. It's way worse than that. Because actually we have another dimension to your graph. We have a longitudinal dimension. and We have cohorts going through this longitudinal dimension. And because of this hump in the population, as these people are now retiring, for the next 15 years, 
up until I retire, the numbers of retired non-productive people is substantially going to increase. So all you nice young people, look at me with some fear and horror. Because you are going to be paying, not just you'll have that narrow productive period, you're going to have to pay for all of us old people retired. And it's even worse than that. Because above the age of 65, 5% 5 of those people have dementia. And above the age of 85, nearly 50%, half of that population, have dementia of one sort. So today, there are 5.5 million Americans living with dementia, and that is going to substantially increase over the next 15 years. Today, it costs your country $400 billion a year. It's extraordinary. $200 billion of that is direct health care costs. Even in a country, I was told, you didn't have any direct health care costs. It was all covered by the... But seemingly, it's not true. That's what the state is paying. Half of that you pay directly. The other half you pay through your taxes. It's not sustainable. And I don't know how many people are aware of this, but the costs of that provision of people, for people with dementia is greater than the costs of cancer and heart disease combined. If you were to take the costs of dementia and turn it into an economy, then the United States of dementia would be the 18th biggest economy in the world. As the European economies are on a downward slope, it won't be long before the United States of dementia has an economy bigger than that of many European countries. So that was why, in a somewhat bizarre um, uh, event earlier this week, I found myself in a room with about 150 people being led in a rendition of Happy Birthday by Francis Collins, head of the NIH, to Kathleen Sebelius, your health secretary for health and human services, as she was announcing the plan, the dementia plan, the US dementia plan. And this is amazing that countries now have a plan for dementia. So the U US has one, it's quite good. And the UK has one, that was why I was over there. Uh, Australia has one, France has one. Many countries in Europe have a plan for dementia. And the reason why they have a plan for dementia is they better have a plan for dementia because without a plan, we're all in really serious problems. I didn't see, look, it even found its way into your local paper here. So what am I going to talk about? Uh, because I haven't really started yet. So <laughs> first of all, and I, I'm gonna, I, I, I want to say, I want to say that I'm an enthusiast for personalized medicine and the use of uh, new technologies. I want to say that uh, because if I don't say that, I might not get invited <laughs> back uh, for another year. But I also want to say that because it's true. I am an enthusiast, but I, I, just want to give, I just want to give a slightly different voice that we may not have heard much of over these two days. First, I'm going to reflect something that Glenn Tre Teesman said yes yesterday. I'm going to remind us of the importance of uh, uh, one of the most important uh, medical technologies we've got. I'm going to give a brief overview of the mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease and where we're going in the search for disease modification therapies. And then I'm going to talk about why we need biomarkers. Then I'm going to show you a bit of data. It's going to be a bit light touch data because I don't have a huge amount of time. I'm going to just show you three studies that we've done. I'm going to be entirely narcissistic about the science here and just show you our science. But I'm going to show you three studies that I've chosen to show you because they illustrate a slightly different point. So I think there's a lesson from each of those three studies. And then I'm going to talk about something that I think we ought to, those of us that are enthusiasts for markers and personalized medicine, need to just pay attention to. Because I think there may be a backlash coming. And I think that we need to be prepared for that. We need to get our arguments straight. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about blood-based biomarkers as part of the entire health system, if you like. So what is the most important of the medical technologies? The most important of the medical technologies is human clinical skills. So those medical technologies, that medical skills of history and examination that we get taught in medical school. 
These are from some notes that were found in medical records in a basement in a hospital in Germany a decade or so ago. And they were written in 1901. I'm going to read them out to you because I think that this is just the most extraordinary account. It speaks to us a century later. <clears throat> so this is the doctor writing. She sits on the bed with a helpless expression. What is your name? Augusta. Your last name? Augusta. What is your husband's name? Augusta, I think. Your husband? Ah, my husband. She looks as if she didn't understand the question. Are you married to Augusta? Mrs. D. Yes, yes, Augusta D. How long have you been here? She seems to be trying to remember. Three weeks. She'd been there for many, many months at that point. What is this? I show her a pencil, a pen, a purse, a key, a diary, a cigar, uh, identified correctly. And at lunch, she eats cauliflower and pork. Asked what she is eating. She answers spinach. How many of your interns write that kind of detail in the medical notes now? Mine don't. Um, and I think we lose something if we lose that careful description of what the patient actually says and is thinking and is looking like. And this is a, an extraordinary, um, and it's well worth reading, actually, the translation of this account. I find it rather moving as well. This was in 1901. In about 1904, this lady, uh, whose name was Augusta Dieter, died. And the doctor, whose name you will have guessed by now, was Dr. Alzheimer, Herr Dr. Alzheimer. He went on to examine her brain. And he did these wonderful drawings of what he could see. And he wrote two of, the, I think, two, some of the most extraordinary sentences in uh, neuropathology and our understanding of brain diseases. He said, in the center of an otherwise normal cell, there stands out one or several fibrils due to their characteristic thickness and peculiar impregnability. Then he said, numerous small millary foci are found in the superior layers. They are determined by the storage of a peculiar material in the cortex. And boy, what a peculiar material it is. Uh, in those few sentences, he's describing um, pretty much everything uh, that we've been working on for the past, uh, I don't know, I was going to say 100 years. It's not quite that, actually. It's the past three decades, really. And he described them better than any, uh, any of us could do. So this is uh, Dr. Alzheimer and Augusta Dieter. She was, in effect, the first person with Alzheimer's disease. And she was a woman in her 50s. And for much of the subsequent century, uh, we thought, we collectively, the medical profession, thought Alzheimer's disease was a fairly uninteresting, peculiar disorder of young people in their 50s. And I'm just going to say that again. Young people in their 50s. I do like saying that. Um, <laughs> it seems so right somehow. But um, it wasn't until the 1960s that we actually realized that the same pathology as in Augusta Dieter's brain was in the pathology of brains of older people who were losing their memory, the senile. We used to just accept that as a normal part of aging. Now we know it isn't, and these people have the same pathology as Augusta Dieter. And that's the pathology that Alzheimer described. This was actually from a patient uh, of mine. And you can see here an amyloid plaque, an extracellular lesion, and these, this here is a neurofibrillary tangle. So in the next three or four minutes, I'm going to really race through 30 years of research that has come to understand pretty much all we need to know about these lesions in order to develop therapeutic uh, interventions. So the first step forward was in 1984 when Glenner and Wong were able to extract from the amyloid plaque this red peptide derived from a larger protein, amyloid precursor protein. This is beta amyloid. This is the cell membrane. This is a type 1 pass, uh, single pass transmembranous protein. This is the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell. This is amyloid precursor protein. And I think it's to our collective shame in my field, we don't really know what this protein does. I think that's a bit of a worry because most of our potential therapeutics are directed against that. 
However, what we do know is that it's metabolized at least here and here, and the beta amyloid peptide tends to self-aggregate. Now, those of you that are interested in drug development, that's all you need to know to come up with drug development programs. And that's precisely what industry did fantastically effectively and entirely on time, entirely on target. There's a great deal of pessimism about drug development in Alzheimer's disease. You'll gather some of that in a moment from me, but it isn't pessimism about the drug development program. That has been exactly as predicted. It's a great testament to the power of modern pharma because all of these approaches were predictable and have subsequently been developed and trialed in man. So beta secretase inhibitors, gamma secretase inhibitors, agents to prevent this thing from binding together, an increased clearance, currently our most optimistic hope for Alzheimer's disease therapy through immunotherapies. Absolutely fantastic. So fantastic that we can begin to describe a pathway now. And I won't go into the reasons why we know this, but we can order these two events. And there's some detail here that we don't need to worry about too much. It probably isn't the lesion themselves. It might be uh, the proteins before they actually are in the lesions. But let's take this as shorthand. We know that genes affect the processing and aggregation of this protein. We know something in the environment, incidentally, the main environmental influence on Alzheimer's disease, metabolic disorders and type 2 diabetes. So if we go back to the talks before lunch, boy, have we got a problem. Not only have we got an aging population, it's a fat aging population with diabetes. Doesn't get much worse than this. And then you get amyloid and then you get something to do with tangles and that's what gives rise to the Alzheimer's disease. This is such a nice scheme and there was so much attention on the amyloid, we kind of forgot the tangle and the tau pathology. You know, I didn't because I'm a bit of a contrarian sometimes. And so because everybody was working on amyloid, I thought I'd really much rather work on something else. So I was working on tau, but I used to go to these meetings. They would all be amyloid, amyloid, amyloid. And I'd be interested in tau and there'd be nobody in the room where I was talking. And I used to complain to my wife about this. She's a tolerant woman. And she would listen, and in the end, she did a really nice thing. She came up with a pun. So that's the pun. And um, I think it's a very nice pun. <laughs> because this protein in the tangle um, is composed of the protein tau. And tau is present in a highly aggregated phosphorylated state. I would so much love to spend the next half hour telling you about this, but that's a story genuinely for another day. My smallish contribution to this area was to discover that glycogen synthase kinase 3 is a predominant kinase in cells, and we took that through a series of small animal models. We did some work in mice, we did some early studies in man, and I'm really, really pleased to be now working with pharma, doing, leading a phase 2 trial of a GSK3 inhibitor. So true translational research, a story for another day. But what is optimistic is that we have all of these therapeutic approaches. It's very exciting, genuinely very exciting. So the last time it was measured, there are something like 700 compounds patented for people for Alzheimer's disease, 50 odd phase two trials, and 10 phase three trials. It's fantastic news. These are really expensive trials, because this is a phase three trial that typically will be 12 to 24 months in very large numbers of people. So this is very, very expensive. Very good news, though, if it wasn't for the fact that uh, it's not looking good for the trials. So the first three or four trials have failed miserably, not even a whiff of a signal. And the next couple of trials will report this calendar year with another one early next year. Everybody expects them to fail. In fact, so much so that you can hear people from industry that are responsible for these trials saying, you know what we hope from these trials that are costing hundreds of millions, you know, half a billion dollars for one of these trials, what we hope from these trials is that we will see a signal on biology. Huh. How is it that we've turned a phase three trial at a half of a billion dollar into a phase two trial? It should be going the other way around, I thought. It's a crazy world. 
Um, and it's a really worrying world because how many of those failures can we get before farmer decides this is too tricky to work in? So let me show you a little bit of worrying data. This is uh, data from a European study that uh, we've run for the past five or six years. Actually, a biomarker study, but this is a cognitive scale, the mini mental state examination. It's the most predominant cognitive scale that's used in studies. It's broadly similar to the sorts of uh, outcome measures uh, as are used in the clinical trials. And quite rightly, the FDA says you have to use them. So let's have a look at this. Uh, this is time. This is four years. These are controls. The first good news is that if I think that you're a normal 75-year-old, then I'm pretty much right most of the time, and you won't get any worse over the next four years in your memory. But look at that. Those are the people that are recruited for clinical trials. They have an MMSE between 10 and actually high 20s, and look at the noise. You want to discover a drug, and you're going to give it to these people, and you're going to look for a signal amongst that noise. Well, good luck, and I wish you well, and I hope you've got really deep pockets, because you know what? You won't. It's a wonder any trial is ever positive. I would say to you, you I think you would have a hard job even, even knowing whether people with dementia got worse looking at that. This is the other problem. This is an intermediate state. So this is a great group of people to treat in clinical trials. They don't have dementia. They have an intermediate state. I can tell they've got an intermediate state at baseline. The trouble is, half don't. Half are actually entirely normal elderly. They look like that. And the other half deteriorate to dementia. But I can't tell them apart at baseline. So that's a problem number one. Problem number two, which, if you're in a good mood, is also an opportunity, is this. So this is the decline of people with dementia. This is where we currently are looking to treat people, somewhere between mild cognitive impairment and dementia. But what we know about people with dementia is that there's a 10 to 20 year preclinical phase where there's pathology accumulating in the brain. And this is not doctors missing or making the wrong diagnosis. This is undiagnosable. There is no clinical symptoms, but there is pathology in the brain. If you could treat those people successfully, you would have a truly preventative strategy for dementia. Now, what a fantastic opportunity that is. Find those people, treat them, and you could genuinely have the hope of eradicating Alzheimer's disease. And there aren't many disorders where you could say that there is a reasonable hope of doing that. The problem is identifying those people. So we have no means of doing that at the moment. So you need biomarkers. And, and, and that's part of the title of, of my talk. I think, so this is my main message, one of my main messages. We will not make progress. We will not have any treatments for dementia until we have a biomarker that allows us to identify and recruit to clinical trials people in that intermediate or preclinical phase. I think that we might also need biomarkers for outcomes as well. So this is a made-up slide by Clifford Jack, but it, so we don't know whether it's true, of course, but it, we'd like to think this would be true. This is the cognition of dementia. If you're really, really clever, he's saying, and you use some kind of cognitive task that we don't yet have, by the way, you might be able to spot that a bit earlier. If you look at the shrinkage of the brain, the atrophy on MRI, you might be able to see it a little bit earlier. And then perhaps there's a tau-related biomarker up here. Perhaps there's a synaptic biomarker up here. Perhaps there's even an amyloid biomarker up here. Oh, we don't know whether there is or not. Perhaps there's some other biomarker that Clifford Jack hasn't yet thought of. But this is a very optimistic slide. The question is, is it true? So the first biomarkers that have been developed are biomarkers of pathology. These are measures that will measure the amyloid or they'll measure the tau, and they can do it in CSF using ELISA or Luminex or something. And you can do it with, this is a PET scan with a radial ligand which binds to amyloid, and you can measure in life the amount of amyloid that's aggregating in the brain. For those of you that are interested in patterns and um, 
the flow of money through the system, this slide effectively is why Lilly bought a small company called Avid for a very large amount of money. And then the reason was because Avid had a radio ligand for amyloid. There's big money attached to this. The reason why there's big money is because we're desperate for a biomarker. And these are pretty good, actually. They're not very good at predicting what's going to happen to people, but they're pretty good at identifying people. The problem is, having a needle in your spine, you know, it's okay, but it's, it's not what you want to do, particularly. And forgive me for this, unless you happen to live in Sweden, where they seem to do it as a hobby. Um, but for most of the rest of the world, there is a degree of antipathy to having lumbar puncture. But you certainly don't want to have lumbar puncture um, more than once or twice a year. You certainly don't want to have it done every month, and you probably don't want to have it done if you're really frail and elderly. Actually, if you're a company that's developing therapeutics, you, don't, you really don't want to have to pay for that either, because it's very, very expensive if you take in the full cost, the full cost of the doctors, training the doctors, the one in 100 or 200 people that have to have an overnight bed to say it's really expensive biomarker. The alternative approach, PET scanning, currently costs around about $3,000 a pop. So, you know, affordable, but you're not wanting to give that on a population basis or to huge numbers of people. So again, this is partly uh, slightly contrarian of me, but while everybody was researching CSF biomarkers, I thought, let's look for blood-based biomarkers. We started that work about 10 years ago frankly expecting to see nothing, but we thought somebody's got to do it, nobody else is doing it, they're all working on CSF, we'll do it. So we set out to try and find blood-based biomarkers. Now I'm going to show you the data. I'm going to show you three separate studies. They're sort of cherry-picked studies because there's a lesson from each one. So this is study number one. Study number one, we use 2D gel electrophoresis to separate proteins, and we use tandem mass spec to identify them. First, we did an analysis of the 2D gel. So we ran some 2D gels on a fairly small number of people. I can't really remember now. I think it was 50 or 60 or so people. Cases, controls, so people with Alzheimer's disease, people without. We did some image analysis of that, and I simply asked the question. We took the density of each one of those spots, treated it as an analyte, if you like, applied some machine learning tools to it, and said, can that pattern of spots identify who's got Alzheimer's disease. Actually, it can. Thankfully, not as well as I can, but it's not, it's not bad, actually. It has a sensitivity specificity of around about 60 to 65%, and a p-value that is very low indeed. So, you know, it's not a biomarker, but it tells us at that point that there was a signature. So we went about to set about a signature, we uh, pulled out those spots, we identified them by mass spec, and then we did some validation or replication studies. Here's one. One of our top spots was complement factor H. Here you see it popping its head up in Alzheimer's disease plasma, but not in these other disorders in a reasonably large number. As a biologist, I suddenly thought this is really interesting because at the time we were um, finding this result, the gene that, is a, the gene that codes for complement factor H was associated with age-related macular degeneration. It's probably the strongest gene to common complex disorder association there is in human medicine at the moment. And why is that interesting to me? Because there are only two disorders with A-beta pathology. And in the drusen of the eye of people with age-related macular degeneration, they have these aggregates of beta amyloid. It's exactly the same protein as in Alzheimer's disease. Isn't that interesting? So, if you happened to have a therapeutic or a potential therapeutic in your back pocket for age-related macular degeneration, my guess is that's going to be interesting in relation to Alzheimer's disease. Lesson number one. There is a signature in blood, and this signature might tell us something very interesting indeed about biology. That work, by the way, widely replicated uh, by many other groups around the world now. So, study number two. Now, I want to spend a, just a little bit of time on explaining this study, because this, what I want you to focus on is study design here. Now, what did I tell you earlier? I said that there's a long preclinical syndrome 
um, where people have no clinical symptoms but they have pathology. That means of our controls, 30 to 50% of our controls have the same biology in their heads, the same pathology as our cases. And yet we compare cases to controls. How nuts is that? Is it any wonder that the geneticists say that they have to do studies of now 80,000 subjects and they're now gearing up to 250,000 subjects? It's no wonder when half of their controls are the same as their cases. It's a crazy design. I mean, it's really stupid. And I've participated in some of those studies. <laughs> um, but they cost a lot of money. Uh, and they're draining huge amounts of resource. And I love my geneticist colleagues. But this is a better study design. This was our first attempt to try and overcome that problem. So in this study, everybody in the study has Alzheimer's disease. So everybody in the study has mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. So we get rid of the apparently normal controls that just aren't. What we decided to do was to try and divide them into those with a large amount of pathology for a given cognitive impairment and those with a small amount of pathology. So we're trying to compare people with aggressive disease to, if you like, relatively mild uh, pathological disease. We did that in two ways. First, by atrophy in the hippocampus, which is a signature of Alzheimer's disease, and secondly, by rate of decline. So a group of people, everybody with Alzheimer's disease, and we've now binned them into different endophenotypes, quantitative traits, in effect, that we've binarized into a large amount of this endophenotype and a small amount of the endophenotype. Did completely independent proteomic studies, and we said we would only take forward proteins that came out of both, and we would then predict a priori in a replication set that correlation. So here's the results. We identify clustering in both uh, of these studies in a relatively modest number of people. We went on to do our a priori validation or replication. I'm not going to spend too long on this. Suffice to say, we see a correlation with atrophy on imaging, a correlation with cognition. We see increased blood clustering in those people who decline more quickly up to the point of blood test and increased blood clustering in those who go on to decline more quickly. That's not that surprising. Those two are interrelated. We then went beyond our a priori, and these are two, I think, quite surprising. Well, one extraordinary and one surprising result. So in collaboration with the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, Susan Resnick and others, uh, NIA, we took some of their samples that they'd collected 10 years before people had amyloid imaging in their brain. At the point they had amyloid imaging, those people were still supposedly normal. We found a modest correlation between plasma clustering, which was elevated then in people who go on to develop amyloid in their brain, even when they're still apparently clinically normal. So this is indicating that plasma clustering is going up in the very, very early stages of disease. So then we did the really hard test. These people might have some other illness, right? They might have some dietary. There may be something about them that we don't yet know about that is giving this as a confound result. So we went on and looked in the mouse. And in the transgenic mouse, these mice have plaques. They have APP presenilin 1 mutations. They have plaques in their brain, but they're otherwise healthy. They don't have much wrong with them. They don't have much cognition uh, defects, actually. They're physically very healthy at this stage. And in those mice, in their blood, clustering is increased. Now, I think this is a really important result, not just for Alzheimer's disease, but for all brain diseases. Because what this is saying is there is a message that has gone from the brain to the plasma in those animals. There's no other explanation. It's a message. I don't know what that message is. Is it protein that has been generated in the brain that has come out of the blood-brain barrier? It might be. Or is it something else that has signaled from the brain to the periphery? I really, if anybody can help me think about how to do the experiments to explore that, I'd be really interested. This is a fascinating piece of biology. Anyway, we publish it, and at the same time as we're doing that, 
the geneticists are doing their genome-wide association studies, and lo and behold, they identify the most important gene associated with Alzheimer's disease after APOE was clustering in these two big studies. I showed you how many our N was. Our N was around about 100 in this study. This one was 16,000, and this one was 14,000. I think by intelligent design, and I know that word has, those words have other meanings, I think by designing your studies intelligently, and by potentially using proteins, because they're proximate to disease rather than genes that are distant from disease, you can scale your um, power of your studies by considerable numbers of orders of magnitude. So what did we do? We protected intellectual property. We've partnered with a biotech, Proteome Sciences. Uh, we licensed to Millipor Merck. We are developing two different, we've developed two different panels, a Luminex panel and an MRM panel. I can tell you that we've um, completed a study of 1,000 individuals. We're doing a little bit of backfill of those individuals. We think this is a qualification level study and we've engaged contract, uh, consultants to open our conversations with the regulatory authorities. So we think we're pretty close to uh, something that might work as a very early biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. And what about those proteins I just showed you? If you flicked through both columns, and if you look at the genomic studies, you'll find a lot of our proteins uh, fall on these pathways, complement 1, C3, CR1 clustering, complement factor H. I think that's telling us something interesting about biology. And so we're now working, doing some repurposing uh, of drugs that have been developed for complement uh, perturbation for Alzheimer's disease. Now, you hear a lot about repurposing. Uh, was, I think Garrett made a reference to this yesterday. And the repurposing you usually hear is repurposing of uh, pharma compounds or generic compounds. Now, repurposing of generic compounds is complicated because how are you going to fund the phase three trials? Repurposing of pharma compounds is problematical because if a compound is on the shelf, it's often on the shelf for quite a good reason, and you might not want to spend a lot of energy on that. So the, our strategy that we're trying to follow is doing some repurposing as drugs are in development. So we're working with people who are developing complement therapeutics, and we're trying to come just behind them in a secondary phase repurposing effort. So lesson number two, study design really matters. It matters probably as much as the technology you use. Oh, and by the way, you can discover something interesting about biology and pathogenesis in these studies. Study number three I'll be rather quick about. We also looked at transcriptomics. So this is blood-based transcriptomics, whole genome study in 300 or so individuals. These are the results, and I just want to point out one thing here, this is a bit of a complicated rock curve, but the uh, dotted red line is the rock curve for the transcript study, and the yellow line is the rock curve for the imaging study, and the green line is the combination of the two. We shift the rock curve to the right and above when we combine different kinds of modalities, and we see that in every single time that we've done this kind of study. When we combine different things, you get a better looking set of data. So we also then are able to look at what's involved. There's all sorts of things involved. There's some interesting things here. Vesicle mediated transport. Who would have guessed vesicle mediated transport was involved in uh, dementia? But it comes out of a similar kind of analysis from the GWAS studies. And actually, if you think back to this morning, to Lloyd Fricker's talk, Remember that nice diagram of the synapse with the peptides and the uh, neurotransmitters coming out? That's controlled by vesicle-mediated transport. We think this might be a new therapeutic target for Alzheimer's disease. So lesson number three, for blood, and probably for CSF as well, the signature that we're seeing is combinatorial, involves multiple molecules, there's no single gene or protein that will do the job, and it's multimodal. It's probably going to get the best quality when we combine different kinds of things. Oh, and by the way, we're learning something about pathogenesis. So in summary, briefly, I think we can find a biomarker 
for Alzheimer's disease in blood. I think there is a signature. I think it's discoverable. I think that looking for quantitative trait ender phenotypes is absolutely the way to go in this disease and probably others. And I don't think there's any single protein that's going to do the job. Oops. So, how are we... Let's wind forward a bit. If I'm right, and we do have biomarkers, and if we're all right, and personalized medicine is going to be part of our daily working lives in the future, how are we going to incorporate that into our routine clinical practice? Well, we've, in the center that I'm, I, I, I'm director of a biomedical research center um, at the Maudsley Hospital, which is a really rather large hospital. It's a group of hospitals, actually, that's the single largest provider of mental health care uh, in Europe. And we've done some interesting things with electronic medical records. So you can't see it properly there, but that's our electronic medical record. We, we went paperless about five years ago with legacy import for five or six years before that. The record that we've got, we designed ourselves. You may have heard about Connecting for Health. Whoa. Connecting for Health is the biggest failed IT project in the history of uh, humankind, and there have been a few, and it was the UK's government attempt at trying to introduce a universal spine or health record across the UK. It didn't work at all, complete failure. Um, we decided not to be part of that right from the beginning, and we built our own. And we built it so that it looked exactly like the paper record. We also built it so dinosaur... Uh, physicians, and I put my hand up for one of these, who refused to use the electronic medical record when we were with patients. I hate using it when I'm with the patient. Even doctors like me can be incorporated. I see my patient face to face, I'm talking to them, I write the odd note down on a piece of paper, I then use my dictaphone to write a letter or a report, secretary puts it onto a Word document and attaches it to this. That's fine. So we went down the route of whatever you want to do, that's fine. We'll work around you as the clinician. So that was the first thing we did. And then the second thing we did was we built a search engine that sucks all of that data out. Actually, we take all of that data every night. We dump it into a database. It's XML'd. It's put into a MySQL database. It's searchable with F Microsoft Fast. Uh, and we've got a, um, a software shell on top that we designed that allows people to interrogate that data. So here's a few figures. We've got 190,000 records, We've got, which is kind of large for mental health. It's probably the world's largest database for mental health. It's only of moderate size for a healthcare provider overall. But I think this is scalable. 35,000 um, active patients at any one time. We have 1,500 new referrals every year. And this is what surprised me. We built some text mining software so that we can utilize all the narrative text that we've got. And we use that then to work out what happens to people who are treated with the symptomatic treatments, the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, and this is what happens to them. This is now data from 3,500 patient years of data of people treated with these drugs. And you can see this is up to the drug treatment. At drug treatment, they then get a little blip, and then they continue to deteriorate. Now that, amazingly, is exactly what was seen in clinical trials. What's amazing is that we do reproduce the clinical trial data. There's about a six month to a one year delay, if you like. At whatever phase you're at, you're about six months or a year better off if you're on drugs. But this is from 3,500 patient years of real world data. That is seven times more than the entire world's literature seven times more than everything else that's ever been measured in research trials. That's the power of electronic medical records from one healthcare provider. Of course, what I want to do is to say, can we work out why some people uh, improve and others don't? Can we look at factors that would help us with personalized medicine? Last couple of slides. So th that's what we've done. We've set up an electronic medical record that works for doctors and nurses. We've got a search engine that allows you to extract data. I'm now going to show you three things that are a work in progress. First, we did this, and this was uh, formally launched just, I think, last week, in fact. We've been working with Microsoft to implement the first mental health um, version of Health Vault. We've called it My Health Box. If you want to see what it looks like, 
If you type into Google My Health Box and the Maudsley, you'll, you'll see what we've done. Interestingly, in relation to the earlier talks today, we're focusing a lot of this on health and well-being and not just disease and illness. So we will have in My Health Box all sorts of things that we think are good for mental health, to encourage people to exercise, to be mindful, um, and to look after themselves. We all have part well, we do have partner devices, so this is owned by the patient. They can use any kind of device to enter data. We'll also have assistive technologies. So when you're looking after people with dementia, we already have sensors in some of our patients' homes that allow us to record movement. We'll have sensors on the fridge door so we know when they've opened their fridge. Sensors on the front door so when we know when they're coming and going. Why do we want to do that? Well, if there's no movement in the house for more than 12 hours, something's seriously wrong. We need to send somebody around. If the fridge door gets opened and doesn't get shut, the person is probably not eating properly. If the front door gets opened and doesn't get shut, somebody's probably left the door and has gone wandering. We need to go and find them. We can put that in the electronic medical record. That's the first thing we've done. Second thing we're doing now so we have the first approval in the UK for what's called consent for consent. So every patient that comes through our door will be asked, do you mind if a researcher contacts you for research? Can we take a blood sample and can we contact you via the electronic medical record and your blood test? So this is not just a biobank, it's a bioresource, meaning you want to do a clinical trial in people that are APOE4 positive, that have high levels of clustering, that meet particular clinical criteria, I put all of that into my search engine and I get out all of those people that have agreed to be approached for participation in research and I can contact them directly. The third thing we're doing is setting up experimental informatics. So this ranges from visualization of the data through aids to decision making based on the data for clinicians to in silico clinical trials that we can begin to do. So it's a very exciting world, and it's one I believe in. However, you will know about this. There's a few instances, prostate cancer is another, but there are increasing concerns in some parts of our communities about how tests are used. So this is a book that I confess I haven't read uh, by Peter Getscher, <coughs> who is a serious person. He's director of the Nordic Cochrane Center, and he is essentially raising along with many other people, some serious concerns about mammography, believing that there is the potential for more harm than good to be done by systematic mammography in the population. So people are worried when they have an abnormal test. They end up having interventions that are painful, uncomfortable, and at the extreme can result in mastectomy, with some women ending up having a mastectomy, even if they haven't actually turned out to have breast cancer. The incidence is low, but what is the relative costs and benefits of that screening in the population? So I think we need to be thoughtful about how we introduce tests. And this is my last slide, I believe. This is what I think we're heading towards in Alzheimer's disease. We already have a huge awareness in the community. I think we need to enhance and not neglect our clinical skills. We need to get more like Alzheimer, not less like Alzheimer. Then I think we need to have the option for a, a test that would enable some decision making. A test with high sensitivity, low specificity that might help the physician then to guide a patient to another test which would have high specificity but maybe low sensitivity and high cost. And that then would result in an indication for treatment assuming we have them and assuming that they're going to be high cost, high cost. Uh, high-risk interventions, and I'll lay money on that. I'll lay money that if we develop therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease, they're not going to be risk-free and cheap. So I think we're going to be seeing a pathway to biomarker implementation. And I think if we're careful about that, if we're mindful of how this is going to be used, I think we can de-risk the fears that are present in some parts of our community. I probably talked for too, too long, and I certainly haven't acknowledged enough all the wonderful people I've worked with. This is just my current group. I want to thank them. I want to thank my f the funders who've been very generous in their funding and you for your attention. Thank you.